Greetings, my friends. Jason Archer here with Scott Porter and Kirk Morales bringing you episode four of Dogs of Wad Radio, broadcasting from the hottest balls, Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, we got a couple of interesting topics to bring to you this week. We're going to be talking a little bit about what are we talking about, guys? Kipping pull ups? Yeah, kipping pull ups. It's kind of the common, uh, you know, thing to talk about in CrossFit. People are kind of ignorant towards. No. Ignorance of CrossFit? Yeah. <laughs> Imagine people talking cheating. about that. Are you the serious? The cheating pull-up, really, yes. is what... Very people, controversial. The cheating pull-up. Is what people, or it's not a real pull-up. Right? It's not a real pull-up, that's right. Yeah, so there's that. Uh, we've got a little news happening. It looks like CrossFit has uh, initiated a lawsuit against the NCSA. Did you guys see that? I saw the article, yeah. I just kind of skimmed over it, and then I saw I think there's a video out on it, too, that CrossFit posted recently. So Yeah, I think um, it, it kind of hit at a timely, uh, uh, or it was really timely when it when it came out because you had that big article that, that got all the attention from Aaron Simmons, or whatever her name was, and then, uh, you know, claiming injuries and, and uh, all this other stuff, and all of a sudden CrossFit comes out, issues this lawsuit against the NSCA, basically claiming that the injury rates that they use in their study are completely bogus. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys read the study, but basically what they did was they took 54 participants and, um, and took them through a CrossFit program. And during the course of the program, they had, I think it was nine or 11 people drop out. And they reported those dropouts as uh, dropouts due to injury. However, because it was a blind study, uh, there was never any follow-up with the people who, who did in fact drop out and they didn't know exactly why. And they ended up publishing these results anyway, um, and it could have just been that these people's schedules changed. Nobody knows, right? But it was published as injury. Sounds like a very accurate study. <laughs> exactly, right? Well, I'm sure everything they've posted in the NSCA is completely you know, legitimate. Yeah. And, yeah, and going back to what we talked about last week is we don't even know who was coaching it, what type of programming were they going through. Yeah, it could have been anything, anyone. I mean, I know that the, the NSCA has been uh, sued in the past, but apparently what happened was uh, Russell Berger from CrossFit basically contacted them and asked them to recant, and uh, apparently they refused. They kind of brushed him off, said, to hell with you. We're just going to put it in it, put it out anyway. Yeah. And apparently this study's been used... Uh, to publish quite a few articles uh, <laughs> expounding upon the injury rates of CrossFit. I think that's what it is, is that obviously the study doesn't, you know, provide any good real hard data for someone to, like, you know, no one's going to read the study and say, oh, yeah, I guess there was only 14, what did you say, 14 people. People are just going to look at the, the highlight and yeah. say, mm -hmm. oh, CrossFit causes injury. So it is kind of defamation or defamation of CrossFit because people are going to keep coming back to that same study. So they've done studies. For every, you know that every time there's a study that says this, there's a study that also says the opposite. <laughs> yeah. So if you are going to do a study, at least provide you know, something with a little bit better data. More than 54 people. I yeah. mean, you could do a study on 54 people in anything and yeah. say whatever you want to make it say. <laughs> yeah, the sample size is way too small. Yeah, yeah way too small. size. It's way too people. small. Yeah, I yeah. mean... It's not even as big as your average CrossFit gym. Yeah, I don't think... I don't Just like we talked about last week, I don't think anyone here is going to say that, you know, CrossFit is could never be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Just like Kirk said, you know, what was the coaching? What was the programming? Um, it is very possible those 14 people did get hurt. Maybe they did. But what does that say? It doesn't say anything. Right. Of course, when there's only 54 people. So, I mean, there's people getting hurt in different activities every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they got to do a study on that. People <laughs> playing hopscotch. You know, we did Walking a hopscotch study. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It kind of speaks to our headline culture, right? Nobody really wants to read past the headline. They don't. Just, you know, CrossFit causes your poo to be green. New study finds, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, <Matt. laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it, it's just sort of, uh, it, you know, it sort of uh, reinforces that whole idea of some of the bogus information we've been discussing, I think, in previous episodes, and uh, kind of leads into an article that you were telling us about a few minutes ago, Scott. Um, Doctor Squat put something out that you were uh, you were sharing with us. Yeah, so I just saw it this morning. It's on uh, BreakingMuscle.com. Um, you can check it out. I think he just posted it today. It's Seven Laws of Training According to Dr. Hatfield, and it kind of applies it towards CrossFit training methods. 
So it's something yeah, I thought would be a good topic to discuss because it kind of goes into you know a little bit of ignorance towards CrossFit, some of the CrossFit methodology, mm-hmm. and you know you hear people saying you know CrossFit you know sucks or it's not good. You know why would you why why would you do CrossFit if you're a swimmer or a hockey player or whatever it is? And you know some people are so I guess you know hooked on crossfit that they want everybody to do it mm-hmm. uh every and whether no matter what athlete you're you are you know and i think it it that's not even what crossfit's trying to say is that it's good for every single athlete right. to different type of sport to different <laughs> type of fitness right so i think you know you see all these articles people attacking crossfit oh you know what does he say here he says um, you know, you're not going to be, you know, a great marathon runner or a great Olympic weightlifter if you use CrossFit training methods. Well, CrossFit's not trying to make you a great Olympic weightlifter exactly. or a great marathon runner, and they never claim to. And I don't think many people go into it thinking that's going to be the end result. No, no, not at all. So I think it's like it comes back to kind of the ignorance to CrossFit. So. People that are doing CrossFit don't think that's going to be the end result. People that aren't doing CrossFit are saying, well, you're not going to be a great marathon runner. It's like, well, yeah, no shit. You know, <laughs> if I wanted to be a great marathon runner, I would just run. Yeah, yeah you know? for sure. And it's interesting that, you know, we have all these sort of critiques of CrossFit to prove points that CrossFit has never claimed, you know, like the one you just mentioned. You know, CrossFit's not going to make you a great marathon runner. Well, exactly. exactly. They never claim yeah. that. They're never going to make you a world-class Olympic lifter. Never claim that they would. Right? What they did claim was that doing the programming would help you be well-rounded in all domains. Yeah. And that's pretty much what it comes down to. And that is the methodology, being prepared <laughs> for the unknown. Right. And, you know, like we talked about before in previous episodes, you know, it's like the, you're, you want to be the 85th percentile guy. So you have to, just in the sport of CrossFit, you have to be consistent across every single time domain, every single strength capacity, work capacity, everything, mm-hmm. uh, if you want to be competitive. Sure. So if you have one weak area, you need to address that weak area in your training or it's going to get exposed in competition. Totally. Right. And that's what CrossFit does is it exposes your weaknesses. Yeah, we, we saw that at the regionals, you know, that, that just recently wrapped up. I mean, obviously, Sam Briggs was the most obvious example, but... You know, to your point, she won, I think she won three events, finished second in a fourth, um, but then when she had that one uh, stumble on the handstand walk, you know, dropped her down to 26 in that one event and knocked her out of contention. Yeah, I mean, CrossFit as a sport is completely different than CrossFit as a, you know, training for fitness. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I think people go wrong is they think that, you know, just because you're a any athlete that you should just start doing crossfit like we talked about earlier today there's a guy that uh he's getting recruited for pro hockey and they put him through a combine fitness test and he can't do one pull up not one not one <laughs> single pull up and this guy is going to be a pro athlete right so i mean could he benefit from some strength training yes mm-hmm. But he doesn't need to start doing CrossFit, and he's going to be a, all of a sudden a better professional hockey player. Right, mm-hmm. right. Um, but again, like Kirk said, you know, most people don't go into CrossFit, don't start doing CrossFit to become an elite level athlete, either at CrossFit or at a separate sport. Sure, certainly not. Yeah, and yeah, I think you have to look at too who's writing these articles and making these claims, and a lot of times it's professional athletes or coaches from a particular area that CrossFit touches, mm-hmm. right? So whether it's a power lifter or an Olympic weightlifter, mm-hmm. um, they're the ones coming out and going, well, all right, CrossFit's incorporating Olympic weightlifting, and just so you know, you're never going to become a great Olympic weightlifter doing CrossFit. Sure, yeah. You know? That's a great so, point. So you have to look at really the perspective on, on who's saying these things. That is a great point. It seems like a lot of the critiques come from people who have specialized in one area or another. But the great thing about, or, or the interesting thing about what you said was, I don't understand why anyone who does powerlifting or Olympic lifting would complain about CrossFit, because as far as I can tell, CrossFit has basically re-put those uh, people on the map. Absolutely. It's, you know it's I mean? definitely helping to grow other sports. Totally. Yeah, there's still some resistance in certain, you know, I guess sports and disciplines. Strawman would be one of them. And I've got some experience there, obviously, but you still see, you know, from social media 
posts, you know, anti CrossFit mm-hmm. from straw man out there, you know, uh, or you know, you put together an event and they just say, oh, that's CrossFit because it's light. Right. You know, and they're just so anti CrossFit, but CrossFit is, is even doing, you know, a lot for straw man, just totally. like it did for weightlifting and, you know, gymnastics too, um, and powerlifting and, and probably most for weightlifting. But, and now they're using straw man implements, and you've got obviously the CrossFit straw man certifications and courses and equipment now. And, you know, they just have to kind of learn to embrace CrossFit. It's going to grow those sports. Well, and I think they need to really look at what's happening there because uh, we talked about expectations of athletes when they come into CrossFit. They don't really, uh, they don't expect to become uh, expert level at, at any of these sports. Um, but as they start going through that learning process, they learn where their deficiencies are. They, they realize what they need to work on. And so for someone to then say, hey, I'm going to focus on Olympic weightlifting or I want to go and start training at a gymnastics gym to get better, um, not only is it helping to grow those other sports, but the athletes are recognizing that if I want to get better in this one particular area, I need to study that one sport a little bit more specifically than CrossFit. So, I mean, it's really helping that other sport from two aspects. Number one, they're getting more attention. Mm -hmm. And number two, the athletes are actually recognizing that their training regimen is the way to go if you want to become more proficient in that one particular area. Yeah, Yeah, that's a great point. You know, I mean, you see people, like Scott was saying, you know, you're not going to take the person off the couch and and put them into a high-level class and expect them to do well. However, the people who come in, and it's not necessarily their goal to be an expert-level runner or an expert-level Olympic lifter, they come in and they start doing these workouts and they find out where the deficiencies are and then who do you see, you know, um, during open gym hours? The people who really want to improve certain areas, they, they've done the workouts, they've identified where they're weak, they come in and they're doing those exercises, doing the Olympic lifts uh, during open gym, they're doing gymnastics during open gym just to make up those gaps so they can perform better in those other areas. I don't think you see that in any other sport. No, you don't. And I think Kirk's absolutely right. You hit the nail on the head. You know, I've seen it here at, at, at Spartan Fit CrossFit, you know. Someone, uh, CrossFit is introducing people to other sports. Mm-hmm. And, and and weightlifting is probably the number one just because, you know, when people come in, chances are they don't have a lot of training on how to properly do the cleans, the snatches, the jerks. So, you know, if that box that they're going to has the proper coaching like we do with Kirk and they have classes, you know, they're they're gonna say, Man, I need to really work on this technique. Totally. You know? And then it's you get those you get those small wins because it's like you come in and you can't power clean a empty barbell and you, and if you do it looks terrible. But you know, they realize that and they say, oh, you know, I need to work this skill. I need to work, I need to spend extra time learning how to do this and not just do it as fast as possible with terrible form, which we obviously don't coach here. Right. And uh, unfortunately, there are some that do that and just say do 30 cleans as fast as possible. But it's like, it's like her said, you know, that they're going to work that, you know, independently from their CrossFit training because mm-hmm. they want to get better at that skill or that, that movement, and then they can start increasing their loads, and then when they come, they do it in a wad or a Metcon, it's like, wow, now I'm actually getting better. Totally. And when you can create those small wins in the CrossFit box and the CrossFit training, you know, then you have a long-term client. Absolutely. And you see results. Yeah. And, and that's what CrossFit is doing, really, is it's introducing people to different aspects of fitness that they wouldn't have been introduced to by going to a global gym. Exactly. You're not going to get the gymnastics training. You're not going to get the Olympic weightlifting. You're not going to get the strongman movements. You're not going to get the power movements. Mm-hmm. You're going to get put on a machine. You're doing three sets of 15, and maybe you do a little cardio on the stair stepper, right? <laughs> so, like, what is so bad about CrossFit yeah. that people just have to continue to write these articles yeah, you know. and do studies? With 46 people and 14 got hurt. Yeah. I mean, look at all the you know people that are just continuing to go into the same gym Monday at five o'clock. Probably don't make it back to the gym till Friday before they go out to the bar and do the exact same stuff over and over and over, and they don't get any results. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, are there are people getting hurt in CrossFit. Yes, mm-hmm. it's happened here at at my gym, which is you know I, it's. You know, it's just it's a truth, the nature of the beast. 
right? People do get hurt doing CrossFit, whether they're competing in CrossFit or just doing it for fun and fitness. Because people want to get better, they're going to push themselves. Right. And you have to do that if you are going to get better. If you never push yourself, you're not going to get better. Absolutely. So, I mean, there's a fine line there. You have to know your own limitations. So, yeah, people are going to get hurt. But the same is true of anything. I think I said it before on a previous episode, you know, you're either going to see a cardiologist from not, no activity or an orthopedist, right? <laughs> right. I mean, and then with that being said, there's there's people that don't do any activity, sit down at a desk all day, and they have hip replacement surgery when they're 40. Right. And I'm getting on my soapbox, <laughs> going off. Preach on, brother Scott. <laughs> Bless you, may your tribe increase. But get out there and move, people. <laughs> do something. All right. Well, speaking of moving, let's move into this uh, kipping pull-up controversy. Uh, man, Jesus Christ! If you just look at some of the critiques, it's not a pull up. It's not a pull not up. A pull yeah, up. No. It's not a pull up. But <laughs> man, some of the some of these critiques are just not only ignorant but just absolutely horrendous and insulting. Uh, I don't even know where to begin on some of. There's one. Uh, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen that video of Chris Spieler where he does his uh, 100 plus pull ups unbroken. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, there's some guy who took that video and then put a commentary on top of it, and he was just going, you know, every time Chris would do a pull-up, he'd go, zero, 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 <laughs> That's zero. pretty funny, but... <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it was pretty funny, but toward the end, it got insulting, you know, yeah. because he was calling, you know, Chris, you know, all these different curse words and names, and it, it just, it turned into this really negative thing after the humor subsided, and I think that... You know, there's just it's just uncalled for. No one in the world is saying that a kipping pull-up is the same as a dead hang straight pull-up. I don't think. Mm -hmm. I think it all comes down to why are you doing that pull-up? Are you doing that pull-up because you want to increase strength, mm -hmm. uh, or are you doing that pull-up because you're doing a wad and you want to be efficient, and you want to get through it quickly? Either way, your your work is exactly the same. The amount of work that your body's doing, it's just a matter of how it's distributed over your your body. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's all about purpose. I mean, you know, if you definitely, if you want to get strong, you want to spend time under load. Everybody knows that. You know, you're going to go do a dead hang pull up, weight it, whatever. You're going to get stronger. But that doesn't mean you can't get stronger doing kipping pull ups as well. You know, because that motion in and of itself requires a lot of stress on joints that you may not be using as, dip, as you know, through the same range of motion anyway on a strict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, you know, I think it, it just keeps coming back to people that are ignorant towards CrossFit. They see a kipping pull-up, whether it be a video of Chris Spieler or they turn on ESPN, they see the competition where they're doing, you know, the, the workout where they're doing kipping pull-ups or, you know, they see a, a video on Facebook, whatever, and they literally have no knowledge of what CrossFit is. They've never stepped inside a CrossFit box. They've never been to a CrossFit competition. They have no idea the level of athletes that CrossFit has, and they just see a kipping pull-up and go, that's not a pull-up. Right. You know, that's cheating. You're cheating. But the reality is that person could outwork that person that's saying that in about any aspect of fitness. <laughs> you know, like, does he even know that Chris Spieler, the guy who made that commentary, does he know Chris Spieler can, you know, clean and jerk probably two times his body weight? Right. You know, yeah, and sure. you know, he's and snatch 225 and he's 150 pounds. 150 pounds yeah. I mean, he does a lot more than just pull-ups. But I think it just comes back to being ignorant towards why they're doing that. They're getting more work done in less time. Totally. And that's power output, like we talked about on first episode. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. But uh, I mean, I mean, who, you know, even the word cheat, like I get ticked when I hear people say people are cheating when they're doing a kipping pull-up. You're not cheating, right? There's just, there's no, if, if you're doing pull-ups in CrossFit and it doesn't specifically say that you have to do a dead hang straight pull-up, then you're going to do them as fast as possible. It's yeah. not cheating. It's yeah. just a different what's, way of accomplishing the same task. What's the standard? As long as you're abiding by that standard and you're getting the job done, who cares? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've, I've explained it to like, straw man friends of me you know, uh, that I have uh, uh, that are against kipping pull-ups. I say, well, it's about getting more work done in less time. And they're like, oh, well, what do you mean? And like, okay, well... If I told you you got to clean and press this 300-pound axle, mm -hmm. and the only way you can do it is by contorting your body underneath the axle, you know, or using your belly to continental the axle and then clean it and then press it, is that cheating? Because mm -hmm. you continental cleaned it, mm -hmm. or did you split jerk it? Was that a true press, or did you have to jerk it? If you know, if the movement is axle clean and press, you know, they typically allow you to either strict press, push press, push jerk, split jerk. It's essentially a ground to overhead. Mm -hmm. 
well, you, you're going to you're going to take the route that's most efficient for you. Right. Mm-hmm. By any means necessary. Yeah. Right. Just get it done. So, yeah. You know, it's it's interesting that you have to explain that to power athletes, right? Because uh, you know, obviously, if you take a look at you know how power is measured, if you have two guys squatting the same amount of weight and they're the same height, all things are equal. They're moving the weight the same distance, right? One guy squats from bottom to top in three seconds, and the other guy squats from bottom to top in one second. Well, the guy who did it in one second is more powerful. He's generating much more power. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing we're doing with the pull-ups. We're, do, we're cycling much faster, which generates more power, mm-hmm. right? Which is basic math when it comes to power creation. So it's, it's interesting that you had to explain that to a power athlete in the first place. <laughs> yeah, well, I can't say that I didn't have that opinion at one point. You know, sure. Two or three years ago, probably uh, it's probably been four, three or four years ago now. Um, you know, I had I've never done kipping pull-ups. I'd never done CrossFit, and you know, on the surface, it, it yeah, you're like, well, that's not that's not the pull-ups that I've always done. You know, and you don't see that in a normal gym. But as a you know, as you start learning about it, and it's, I think the first time I did a set, and then you know, I did maybe I think the first time I tried them, I did like. 100 kipping pull-ups in one session, not in a row. Right. Okay. Not, not in a row. Not Chris Feeler. Zero. Zero. Also, I also, Zero. I also weigh more than Chris Feeler. Uh, and he's a beast, so I cannot do 100 in a row. But I did 100 in a session, and what I noticed was just extreme soreness. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was I had been way I was way more sore from a hundred kipping pull-ups. Obviously, I I can do a little bit more reps in a set than I could with doing strict. But I think I and maybe I did like sets of 15 or 20, and then when I got tired, I was doing sets of 10 or whatever it was. But I and this wasn't a, a, a wad or anything. It was just you know messing around because I was brand new to CrossFit. But I mean, I had some soreness to my brachialis. Mm-hmm. I had some soreness in my lats. Mm-hmm. I mean, that I had never experienced before. Just doing strict pull-ups. Well, and, and look at the context of that too, right? Your goal at the end of that was to do 100 pull-ups. How long would that have taken you if you tried <laughs> to do them all strict? Yeah, it would have been it would it would have been like twenty sets of five. Right. Yeah, it would have taken me probably at least twenty minutes. Right. Yeah, it would take me forever. So yeah, it's creating a different stimulus to your body, mm-hmm. and that's what I noticed from the beginning. I was like, man, there's something to this. And totally. That has played around with kipping pull-ups, but you know, like you said, it's 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 not a strict pull-up it's just a it's a kipping pull-up and a strict pull-up two different movements very different movements so you know having uh, sort of identified the difference between those two you know obviously a lot of people coming into the crossfit gyms nowadays probably don't have a lot of experience with it maybe have never seen it before so you know when you have that new person coming through the door you know what sort of training or progression do you want to take that person through to get them to the point where they're comfortable doing that kipping uh, uh, pull-up in the first place. Yeah, I think that's a good topic to discuss because, um, and you'll get people, on, in, you know, in both camps that will say, you know, you can't, you shouldn't be training the kipping pull-up until you have X amount of strict pull-ups. Mm-hmm. And then there are other people out there that are, you know, well, you know, known strength coaches that will say, no, I, the day one, I, I have people start working kipping pull-ups, mm-hmm. or at least the kipping motion, mm-hmm. you know, being able to activate that core in that hollow position, you know, and they may start out with hollow rocks on the floor, and they may just have them jump up on the bar, hang, and kind of feel as they tense their core. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, obviously if someone is at the point where they can't even do one pull-up, telling them to swing as fast as possible and get their chin over the bar at all costs mm-hmm. is... I mean, most people would agree that's probably not a good idea. And right, what are right. you going to get out of that anyway? Sure. So, like from my perspective, as you know, as a coach, is uh, you know, it obviously depends on the individual. So, just like all the other, work, you know, any other kind of CrossFit movements or workouts, you're going to typically scale to that person's fitness level, strength, etc. And uh, you know, one thing would be you know, someone that's coming, you know, straight off the couch that doesn't have a lot of fitness they're probably gonna have some mobility issues through the shoulder. Mm-hmm. So just getting them to reach a shoulder extension position, which would be the kipping pull-up, you're gonna be creating a lot of shoulder extension, it's, pr- you know, it's probably gonna be pretty difficult. And then having them do that dynamically when they can't reach that, you know, and a, just a static stretch, then that's probably a bad idea. Mm-hmm. So what you would have them do is build up their base of strength through strict pull-ups. And we can talk about the use of bands and progressions and stuff, but 
Uh, I don't necessarily think that you have to have a certain amount of strict pull-ups to start working your kipping pull-ups. I think you can work them pretty early on, even if you can only do, say, a couple of strict pull-ups. Um, but I do think people, they want to, and like, at least in CrossFit, they want to do pull-ups so bad that they they forget to work the strength piece. Mm -hmm. They forget to work the strict, and they just focus on kipping. And I think there needs to be a balance. Yeah, I, I don't think it should be one or the other. That's a great point. And this holds true with any other movement. You may be working one movement for speed or reps or endurance, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't also be working that movement on the side for strength. And I think the same holds true for pull-ups. If you want to work your kip, great. But don't also forget to you know keep working your strict pull-ups so that you can get stronger in the movement as well. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's how we program it here. We program that here for the competitors. Um, you know, even for people that are looking to compete in a sport of CrossFit, we still do strict handstand push-ups, strict pull-ups. But it's especially true for people that are just coming through the door and have zero pull-ups, zero strict pull-ups. Sure. You would never just say, oh, just go work your kipping. You know, you, oh, you can't do a strict pull-up? Well, put a band on and just kip the shit out of it until you get your shit <laughs> over the bar. You know? right. uh, and uh, how are you? How is your body going to adapt to that stimulus and get better if you just stay with the thick band mm -hmm. and just kip the crap out of it? You're not stimulating your muscle to adapt and get come back and grow stronger to where you can actually get a strict pull-up. Sure, sure, absolutely. So what do you say to that person who comes in and they see the motion and they want to do it? They've read, you know, all these articles out there talking about how they're going to injure their shoulder and this, that, and the other thing. Uh, you know, what do you say to that person to sort of um, put them in the right mindset, put them in the frame of mind where you know, we're going to take you through this pro progression, get you in the right positions. I mean, I think probably one of the weakest positions I see when people are starting either pull up is just not keeping that shoulder active. You know, they let that shoulder go yeah. at the bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, they're putting a lot of stress and strain on on the labrum and everything that connects all the way down the side of their their torso. You know, and then all of a sudden you get you know, that soreness like you're talking about in the brachialis and the extensor, you get it at the bottom of your bicep where it inserts uh, into your forearm, you know, so you can, you can feel where all this tension is being created. So, you know, how do you walk someone through that and get them past the point where they might have that fear or that, you know, that, that sort of objection to doing this in the first place? I think back to Scott's point, the first thing you have to do is identify really where's that athlete at. Um, do they have mobility issues? Do they have strength issues? Um, but I mean, I, I wouldn't say that this particular point is, is specific to pull-ups. Uh, you can, you know, ask that same question about anything really. Um, hopefully, you're working with someone that understands that they need to go through the basics before they can start getting into more of the advanced movements, or even maybe before they can even start attempting strict pull-ups. Mm -hmm. um, so, sort of coaching ego, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah, it definitely is. And you're going to get people that listen to you and you know, people that don't listen to you mm -hmm. that are stubborn and they just really want to get that kipping pull up <laughs> and they really want to get that kipping handstand push up. Sure. So, but I mean, that's why we're coaches and that's what you're paying us for. Right. You know, that's why you come here and you pay, you know, the, the price that you pay is to so get people that are, have the experience to tell you how to progress. Mm -hmm. You can either take that coaching and or not, I guess. Mm -hmm. And there, there's nothing wrong with addressing the potential for injury to these athletes if they have an ego problem. Um, I mean, I, I know that I do it when I'm warming up um, with some of my athletes and I tell them, listen, this is why we're doing this stretch. This is why you want to make sure that you take this warm up slow or, or whatever it is, is to prevent injury in this area. And if it scares them, great. Because that will really bump them down a few notches and make them listen to you because no one wants to hurt. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Coach Kirk is scary. Yeah. <laughs> you could feedback. die and get rhabdo as well. <laughs> <laughs> you would bring a rhabdo. <laughs> Every day oh, now, I'm going to coach all my classes and start out with just forewarning uh, today's workout sucks and it's possible you could get rhabdo. That's right. All right, let's go to work, guys. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Well, he does bring up a good point because I think people will come in here, and we've had a number of people that come in here, and they just want to learn so fast because they look at the top person. You know, they look at the top guy in here, the top girl in here, and they're like, man, you know, look at that guy bust out some 20 butterfly pull-ups or whatever it is. And you know, everybody wants to get better, you know, no matter where they're starting at. And so they see them working on something, so they go over and try. Mm -hmm. So it's just the standard 
uh, human nature. You see it in LA Fitness. You see it in all the you know gyms. Is they're like, hey, what's that person doing? He looks pretty good. Oh, okay, yeah, maybe I'll try that, that movement. Mm-hmm. And they have no idea what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And people, some people still do it here. And it's like you have to realize where you're at. Yeah. Where where are you at with your mobility? Like Kirk said, where are you at with your strength? With your fitness level? Mm-hmm. Should you even be attempting this right now? Ask your coach. You know, probably gonna have an answer for you. Okay, mm-hmm. well. Can you do a strike pull up? No. Okay. Can you reach shoulders in? No. Okay. Well, let me see you just hang from the bar and just try to tense your core. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you need to work on that. And here's some other things you can do to progress your pull up in a strict form. And then also, you know, you talk about the kipping or whether we use bands or not. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And I think it's really hard for people to uh, sort of you know, sort of receive that and digest it when they see out of the corner of their eye, you know, the guy that's been crossfitting for a while and he's, you know, blazing through, you know, a series of butterfly pull-ups, right? Just wham, 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 wham. He just wants to get to that point immediately, right? And, uh, you know, it's probably, uh, maybe this is a good time to, to draw a distinction between the two, but, you know, as a general rule, if you have that, that strict pull-up, at least a couple, and then you've progressed into having that kipping pull-up, then you might start talking about a butterfly. It generally kind of goes that one, two, three. So yeah, I, I think that all depends as well. I mean, I know personally, I was able to do butterfly pull-ups be- mm-hmm. before I could do kipping because for whatever reason, that movement was a lot easier for me. And to this day, it's a lot easier for me. I think it's easier for me as well. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that, that doing a butterfly kip is any more dangerous for you or, or necessarily requires... I mean, it requires a little bit more skill, maybe, but it just depends on how your body is. For some people, like myself, butterflies are easier, and so the natural progression was to do butterflies and then learn how to kip for when my butterflies break down. Right. Um, But I don't don't think as a rule that you should necessarily have to put athletes through strict kipping than butterfly. Mm. Yeah, I I agree. It's definitely going to be individual. For me, it was the opposite. Like, you know, kipping came very natural from the beginning. I was just like, okay, just use your body a little bit, Sw- swing a little bit, mm-hmm. not an extreme kip, but just a little bit of a swing, kind of tense your core. Uh, but the butterfly, I mean, it was like I was having a seizure on the bar. <laughs> it was like I couldn't figure that crap out. I was like, yeah. And you see, you watch it, the tutorials on YouTube, and you see people yeah. doing it. And you're like, God, it looks like it's so so easy. It's flowing, mm-hmm. and then you get up on the bar, bar, and you're like, I'm not doing anything. I just saw. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's one of the reasons that you know when you know when someone sees it, you know, and then they they maybe try it when no one's looking. You know, yeah. they see. Oh it, yeah, they believe me, it. I was doing it by myself. I yeah, for sure. <laughs> you're not alone. Right? <laughs> yeah, we all had that mm-hmm. moment in the gym by ourselves. <laughs> But, um, you know, I think Kirk's probably the exception rather than the rule. Yeah. I, I think most people yeah. you know, find it to be a more difficult motion. And, and not to say that it has to progress one, two, three like that. But I think, um, you know, once someone has a basic understanding of that, that standard kip to go to the butterfly, it's really very, it's two completely different motions. And you kind of have to, you know, separate your mindset from one into the next. Well, I think strength has a lot to do with it, too. So I think one of the reasons that I was able to excel at the butterfly first is because my back was a little bit stronger. Mm-hmm. And so that pulling motion into the top of the butterfly was easier for me than trying to control my core at the bottom of the kip. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and, and just to hit that. You know, point a little bit further is, I think you need more strength to do butterfly pull-ups than you do kicking pull-ups. Yep, totally. and that's why you, when you see beginners start trying to do the butterfly, it sometimes it can be again like a seizure <laughs> on the bar. I mean, they're just flopping around, and and so that person, yeah, they need to come back and build up that strength base a little bit more. And it is a skill a mm-hmm. little bit, and you have to, you are going to have to practice to get that butterfly pull-up to be pretty crisp and fluid. Yeah, uh, and something you have to work on all the time, but yeah, I mean, I think you know, j- just further is just that you know you need to train all aspects of the pull up. Uh, just to kind of sum up that point is just I feel like you need to work strict pull ups, you need to work kipping pull ups, and then eventually you can bring in the butterfly, or if you've got some strength base, you can do it, and that you have the mobility. But uh, uh, as far as the bands go and like a, a level of progression to building up to a pull-up, that was kind of, I, I saw an article posted recently that we were talking about before we started the, doing the show, is uh, like an anti-band article for pull-ups. Hmm. It was on Breaking Muscle again, and uh, I don't remember the author, but they're saying that, you know, pull-ups, you shouldn't be using bands for pull-ups only for pushing movements. Hmm. And what was the and justification for that? 
So the justification had something to do with, the, according to them, the strength curve is such that when you are in the pull-up at the bottom position when you're in extension, you're at your st strongest. Mm -hmm. And then when you're at the top, the flexion, you're at your weakest. Uh, I don't know about you, but I know that I've seen hundreds of people that have attempted pull-ups and people that can't do any are going to fail in that bottom half of the movement. Mm -hmm. sure. Well, if that's where you're strongest, shouldn't you be all the way to pull all the way up to the bar? Almost. Mm -hmm. But that, and that, the bands are give you the most help or tension at the bottom, mm -hmm. which is actually where I think you are the weakest. And then it progressively deloads towards the top, and which makes it harder to get over the bar. But that's where you should be able to finish it off. Mm -hmm. So he, the author compares it to like deadlifts and squats and accommodating resistance for those movements. So for example, a squat, if you're going to accommodate resistance at the top of the squat, when everything is under extension, you are stronger. And so at the bottom, you're weaker. So at the bottom of your squat, the load is the least. And at the top, you would accommodate that resistance curve by increasing it. So like chains, for example. Right. So if you're in the bottom of a squat and you have chains, chains are deloaded onto the floor so that you're just using the barbell weight. Right. And then as you come up from your squat, the chains unload from the floor, making the, the squat harder, but the strength curve is such that you you're, have better leverage at that point. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can apply more resistance as you're increasing your strength curve. Mm -hmm. so that's, the, that's the concept, but he tried to make the parallel with the band pull-ups, and I didn't see where he was going with it. I think bands are can be very useful for pull-ups, but like we, you know, like we said, you know, earlier before the show, is that I think the problem is that people use it as a crutch. Yep. Yeah. For sure. You don't want to get dependent on them. I think Kirk was making that point as well. Yeah, you don't want to become dependent on them, and, and you also need to realize, like you said, Jason, that if you want to get better at it, you have to progressively go down in the size of band that you're using right. in order to eventually be able to do it without a band. Mm -hmm. And if you constantly in every workout go to the wall and you're grabbing the same band that you've been using for the past three to four weeks, you're never going to lose that band. I mean, that band is yours. You might as well carry it around with it because you're going to need it for every single workout you ever do the rest of your life. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the whole the whole point of increasing that strength profile is time under load. So if you never change the load, if you never increase the load or the time that you spend in it, you're not going to improve. So uh, one of the things I do notice a lot, and I see people always grab the same size band, and they'll stay on that same damn band for months. You know, I mean, literally for months. And, they'll, and it just, like you said, becomes a crutch. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've never really seen that during a workout, though. It's usually when people are working by themselves that I see that. I think most, uh, you know, most of the time when I see people working with coaches, they're constantly, coaches is, is, is wanting, to, wanting them to progress and move away from that. So that's, you know, obviously what you want to have happen. But, you know, definitely I can see the point of, of it becoming a crutch. Um, you know, for those people who never decide to step outside that comfort zone. In addition to that, uh, the, the band is great to help compensate for lack of strength. Um, as you start getting into different movements, though, not only can the band become a crush, but I, I've seen it inhibit uh, movement quality for mm -hmm. certain movements. So especially if you're, if you're trying to learn how to kip, mm -hmm. and some people need a bigger kip than others, right. um, depending on their strength. And I've seen people try to kip with that band, and one of two things happens. They either can't do the, the, the kit properly because the band's stopping the range of motion. Yeah, it hits your chest. Yeah, or they, they yeah. you know slide out of the band and they go crazy flying off the bar. <laughs> you know, and so at that point you need to realize, all right, this band is preventing me from learning the skill. Sure. Um, you know, either I need to get stronger uh, and keep using the band to do that, or I need to get rid of the band and start learning the skill just on the bar by myself. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's like you said, like, I think Scott hit on this when we first started talking about kipping pull-ups. You know, you want to make sure that the person who's learning has a good hollow rock, right? And you have to hold that hollow rock position. Mm -hmm. Well, a band's not going to allow you to do that. Right. You know, it's not going to allow you to swing back and forth and come in and out of it. And that's your base motion coming out of the bottom of the kipping pull-up. Simple as that. So if you don't at least have that, take the fucking band off the bar and get the hollow rock going. You know, then come back with the band when you're ready to start adding the, the upward motion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what I used to do before, you know, we you started using bands, and I just trained somebody one on one, and we we're going to do a pull up progression, uh, you know, program for someone that is at zero pull ups and they want to do say five mm -hmm. pull ups on their own. You know, in the beginning it was hold their ankles, both 
uh, hold both of their ankles. Now, that's someone that can at least do is somewhat close. Mm-hmm. You hold both their ankles, and you kind of give them an assistance from there. And then you can, the next step would be just to hold one ankle, and then you just alternate ankles each set. And then from there, you can just kind of push from the hips or the low back. And surprisingly, it works pretty well. And then on addition to that, what I would have them do is work the eccentric piece. Mm -hmm. So you have them start at the top of the bar and hold the locked out position. Now you can do two different things. You can work the isometric, which is just hold the top position for say 10, 15 seconds, multiple sets of those. Or you can have them hold it and then lower uh, eccentrically and lower like say as slow as possible during that negative. And that might be, say, 10 seconds. It might be less if they can't control their body weight and they just lower really quickly. Mm-hmm. But um, you may say, let's do three reps of 10-second negatives and three sets. Mm-hmm. And that right there will increase your strength dramatically by working the eccentric because that's where you're actually breaking down the muscle sure. and then coming back growing stronger. Mm-hmm. If you only work the concentric piece of the pull-up with the band, you're never going to come back stronger. Right. It's kind of like the push-up where you're off your knees the whole time and you're never eccentrically loading with your full body weight. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to get that eccentric uh, portion. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like we are talking about, just more time under load when you're coming down on that eccentric piece. Yeah. For sure. All right, so, so um, we're, uh, we're coming into the home stretch of the show here. You guys want to bottom line what we're, uh, what we're getting at on the pull-ups here? Go ahead, Kurt. <laughs> uh, bottom line, uh, I'd, I'd say there are probably various bottom lines we can get to here, but um, in terms of, you know, is it a pull-up? Yes, it's a pull-up. There are different types of pull-ups. There's different reasons for doing different types of pull-ups. So stop being ignorant. You know, figure out what the purpose is and, and why you're trying to do this movement, and uh, and just get over it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, something I wanted to say earlier but forgot. Ask yourself this, if you wanted to uh, be fast and you want to run a very fast, let's say 40 yard dash, and you've been sitting on the couch for the last year, are you going to go out to the track and just start running 40 as fast as possible? I'm rent some skates. What's that? <laughs> I'm going to rent some skates. You're going to rent some skates. <laughs> no, you're not going to do that. You're going to go out and start like probably a conditioning program with some slower paced running mm. and some jogging and then build up to that dynamic, explosive running and sprinting and then all-out efforts. Just like with the pull-up, you're not going to come in and just do the most fast, dynamic type of pull-up if you're, if you're off the couch. Absolutely. So it's not inherently bad to do kipping pull-ups. There is a purpose for it. It is a pull-up. It's just a kipping pull-up, not a strict pull-up. For sure. So how does a gymnastics, how does a gymnastics athlete get on top of the bar? What do they do? Do they kip? Definitely it's magic. Yeah, definitely don't be straight. It's yeah. magic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I think um, you know, just to sum it up for me, I basically, I mean, there's no such thing as a bad motion or a bad training tool. Only bad application and stupid people. So at the end There's of the day, no shortage of the stupid people. Yeah, yeah. Just, <laughs> don't be stupid. You know, don't be stupid. And uh, yeah, I think know that's, your body. That's where I'm going to leave it. Yeah. You guys uh, have any uh, topics uh, that we can give as a preview for next week? Maybe a hand care or something like that. Now that we're doing all these kipping pull-ups, our hands are getting torn up. Yeah, those. Uh, I'd say those badges of honor really aren't badges of honor at all. Yeah, get rid um, of your calluses, people. Yeah, absolutely disgusting. Sneak preview. Terrible. It's gonna inhibit your workouts. Tape your hands. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, with that, we're gonna sign off, guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.